it is now my pleasure to bring to the stage our next panel. It is our next generation panel, nonetheless, one where we are going to hear from scholars and experts on how we engage the next generation of IP enthusiasts, scientists, engineers, inventors, and innovators. Uh, it is my pleasure to have Paul Soule, who joined us at lunch as our luncheon sponsor from the Florida High Tech Corridor to moderate this panel. Um, as Paul is coming to the stage to introduce his panel, uh, I would like to call out a very interesting and remarkable thing that is taking place at our conference. On the first floor of the convention center, and I don't know if you have visited it, we do have the Smithsonian traveling exhibit called Change Your Game. The USPTO, along with other collaborators, collaborated with the Smithsonian Institution to place a permanent or more permanent exhibit at the National Museum of America, American History called Change Your Game. But we have had the opportunity to bring a traveling exhibit here to Raleigh, and we are anticipating between today and tomorrow over 600 local school students participating with the Change Your Game traveling exhibit. And that's in part brought to you by the National Academy of Inventors. So Paul, I'm excited to turn the floor over to you and your remarkable panel. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, hey, we're in the home stretch now. And to add on to what Elizabeth said, because I'm going to introduce Emma, who is part of that Change Your Game thing. What was the room number? 304. 304. OK, so after this, go down to 304, see those students in action, because it does play into this panel. Um, and I'm going to change the script a little bit, don't freak, is that if you do have a, I was going to say no questions from the audience because now I have 26 minutes and 30 seconds. If you do have a question for the panel, please come up to the mic and I'll stop my questioning and, and I want to be able to keep engaged with, uh, um, with the audience on this one because to me this is the most important panel. And I say that not because I'm sitting here but because it's the future of what we're all about. You've heard it this morning about the importance of, uh, of the next generation. We've got a great panel. I'm going to introduce them and let them talk about themselves and how they fit into the next generation. So a quick introduction, then we'll go down the line. Uh, first, Elizabeth Albro. Elizabeth, thank you for being. She is the Commissioner of Education Research, uh, Education Research at the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education. So we have the U.S. Department of Education here. Thank you mu very much for uh, being here. Uh, Emma Gron. Emma is part of, and she's got this super long title that has to do with the Smithsonian, the Lemelson Center, and there are all these interconnected pieces, and I'll let her talk about that. Um, but really for the study of invention. So you heard this morning about organizations like the Invention Connection and all those things that she can talk about and actually show you what's going on downstairs. So thank you for, for that. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca Schroeder. Um, she's the Interim Associate Dean at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Re Rebecca, thank you for being with us. And then uh, Vashali uh, Udipa. She is our U.S. Commissioner of Patents at the USPTO. So I didn't know we had a commissioner, but now I do. So that's one <laughs> of the benefits of being able to moderate panels. You get to meet people. And you heard earlier today how many folks we have from the USPTO, uh, which, is, which is great because they're a key part of it. Uh, so with that, let me go back down the line, and, and let me start with you, Elizabeth. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, kind of how you got into the role you are, and then how your organization feeds into this next generation of invention. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you all for having me uh, be here. I've never been to this meeting before, and I love having the opportunity to listen to all of you all talk about tech transfer and innovation manage management and all the things I've learned about so far. So a little bit about me and what I do and why I'm here. So my uh, background is as a cognitive scientist. Don't know if I have any other cognitive scientists in the room. All right, I got at least one. one Excellent. Here. Good. Um, and I have for forever been really interested in how what we know about how people learn plays into how we teach kids to learn, right? And as all of you all know who are in faculty positions, you often have the cognitive science and the psychology department on one side of the university, perhaps in the College of Arts and Sciences, and you have the College of Education 
on the other side of the university. And so my mission has been to bring those two pieces together through the research and science that I fund. Um, at the Institute of Education Sciences, we are the independent research evaluation and statistics arm of the Department of Ed. And so it is my job to uh, fund high quality research to help develop the next generation of talent, in, not only in STEM, but in all of the fields that education is all about. Awesome. Happy to be here, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Emma. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Gron, and I work at the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the National Museum of American History, which is a part of the Smithsonian Institution. So I'll probably only say that whole thing once, and from here on out, <laughs> I'll just call us the Lemelson Center. Um, but our work is really focused on inspiring everyone, but especially young people, to see themselves as inventive. And so through our programs, we promote everyone's kids in strong inventive identities by inviting them in to practice <coughs> invention themselves, move through the steps of the invention process, and begin to sort of build the skills and habits of mind that all of you use every day. We know that not everyone is going to maybe become a member of the National Academy of Inventors, but no matter what they do in their lives, perhaps it's that they struggle to wake up on time so they move their alarm clock across the room, or perhaps it is in a STEM career, they're going to need inventive problem solving. Um, and so our programs, which we would love for you to come see, as uh, Paul said, it's downstairs in room 304. We're doing it in real time here, inviting kids to dig into that messiness of invention, give it a try themselves, um, see what works, tweak it, try it, fail and try again. And ultimately, when we leave, we hope that they see themselves in a new way that's going to build some capability um, and show them that they, too, can be an inventor. Yeah, thanks, Emma. And I'm going to add a couple of comments. So I feel like, yeah, I can moder moderate a panel, but I want to add to it because I truly feel from the Florida High Tech Corridor and, and, and really the larger region and state and, and country about the value, I keep I keep realizing that we have to go earlier and earlier and earlier. So I get a chance to go to the Henry Ford to be a judge at Invention Convention here a couple of weeks ago. If you've ever been a part of that organization and, and offered to be a judge, take it. We had a group, our three judge panel was with fourth graders. If you wanna see a group of kids who can identify problems quickly and then come to solutions and follow a structured program, to then be a member of the NAI at some point in the future, that's an organization that you ought to be a part of. And then to go visit the Henry Ford, if you haven't seen that place, it's, it's amazing. So I keep resonating with getting earlier and earlier into, into what our kids are doing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, talk to us about uh, University of Texas San Antonio. Well, thank you all for having me and thank you. It's an honor to be an honorary member of the NAI uh, now. Uh, so the University of Texas at San Antonio, uh, we have embarked on a, a, a journey to help promote um, broadening participation in emerging technologies and STEM uh, through a consortium that we have a partnership with MITRE and ORAU. Um, through this consortium, we have developed a series of modular components that can be integrated into uh, courses across the university. And we're hoping uh, through these that we are able to allow students to interact with these um, technologies at a much earlier um, time during their educational journey um, and cultivate that identity and interest um, early on so that they can then continue their journey and maybe one day be members of NAI. Um, through the consortium, we have <coughs> cultivated partnerships with community colleges um, and other universities. And one of the unique things I think about our program is that we are doing this across disciplines. Um, so we want to make sure that students understand that no matter what discipline they're wanting to go into, that they have the capability of using these technologies um, and hopefully showing them that yeah, you may be going into fashion design, but there are ways that data and AI and machine learning are gonna be integrated to that in the future. Um, so that's just a few of the, the benefits of the program that we've cultivated, but it's just, um, it's an exciting time to be part of the innovation pathway 
Yeah, and I think you, and you talk about that exciting time. We heard about that earlier today about how a lot of things are kind of converging yes. on an ability to do partnerships, and we'll talk more about that in a, in a second. Uh, Vashali, tell us about, and, and the thing I told Vashali was, you know, when I first joined this group at the corridor, I thought about USPTO just as, well, that's patents, I guess. Uh, and what you've educated me on and what the team has educated me on, there's a lot more than just the patent piece. So walk us through the USPTO, your role there, and then how does that play into the, to the fostering of the next generation? Sure, so again, um, I am the commissioner of patents. So what does that mean? You're at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. There is a commissioner for trademarks and a commissioner for patents. And so for those of you who have gotten your invention patented, you had to go through the patent office. And so what we do, and I am the chief operating officer of the patent division, so everything that is involved with getting a patent sort of comes through the patent division from the minute that you um, file your application and the programs you use to file the application, how it's processed, the examiners that look at the applications and making sure it gets in the right examiner's hands to when it's um, granted and things like that. So all of that, and there are, underneath me, there are 10,000 people that make that happen. But beyond just getting the patent, it is so important for us to sort of, we see the value in, of in, innovation. And we wanna make sure that everyone who could be a part of that innovation ecosystem can play a part of that. So for us, um, we do so much with regards to outreach and through partnerships to enable people to, to expand the amount of people that come to the innovation ecosystem, but we care so much about the next generation too. And so I'm talking a little bit about partnerships that we have. Um, the Smithsonian and the Lemon Sitting, like the Change Your Game uh, is something that the USPTO has also um, you know, worked and just an amazing, amazing um, uh, exhibit. But you think, I have two boys. They love sports. And to get them to think about innovation, there's so many different ways we can do it. And so that's just a great example of how we can do that. Um, then with the NIA, uh, there's, this is a, another wonderful partnership. And we have the GAIN Mentorship Program. And this is a way for young innovators to get paired up with um, uh, ac people in academia. So for those of you who want to be a mentor, this is really important. And so think about being a part of that. And then there's video series that we do from campus to commerce um, through that partnership. So how do you get something from you know, your idea um, and then moving it from the lab to commerce and giving those inspirational stories through video series so that it, it, it sparks the interests of others. Um, and then most importantly, when you're thinking about the next generation, you're thinking about the teachers, right? And so we do a lot to make sure that we um, support and we work with the teachers. So one of uh, the things that we have is the National Summer Teacher Institute, and that's a program for elementary, middle, and high school teachers and it gives them free, ready-to-use curriculum and ways that they can teach um, students about the innovation mindset. And then one other thing I wanna talk about is um, the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That's another great partnership. But through that, we have Camp Invention. And so just last year, we were able to get 400,000 students to go through Camp Innovation um, invention, sorry, camp invention, and let them think about that inventor mindset from a very young age and think and learn about intellectual property. So these are just some of the many programs we have. So it's, the USPTO is not just about the things we do to get your patent, but getting the people into that innovation ecosystem to spark that innovation, because it's so important for our global economy, national security, uh, you know, just so many different things. Yeah. No, thank you for that. So rules for the audience, uh, feel free to walk up to the mic at any time now. We have 14 minutes left. So if you're burning a question in your head and you want to come up and ask it, don't wait till the last second because we might lose you. So thank you for, th for that piece. So I'm going to go back to Elizabeth and talk about, and, 
in our prep call, um, and, I, and Elizabeth was great when she took this comment from me, I said, okay, Department of Education, I just think of education as we sometimes, and there was a quote from Carl Sagan, we beat the creativity out of our kids. Um, and there are different ways to do it. And you highlighted some of the research that you're doing, especially in, in the four-year-olds, which I thought I was driving things early, and you're really driving. So talk us through kind of the research that you're doing and what you're finding as it relates to the next generation of inventors. Oh my gosh, I could spend way more than uh, the two or three minutes that I have available, but I think I would like to just open this up to you all. The Institute of Education Sciences is essentially the NSF of the education world. And all of us know that it's incredibly important for us to figure out ways to improve the education opportunities and experiences of all the kids in our nation. And so what my portfolio of work does is it supports helping learning and helping like build new programs out. So for example, in terms of the preschool piece, cognitive scientists, four-year-olds, they are my favorite age group. If anyone's got a four-year-old, send them my way. Um, <laughs> But one of the programs that we funded was actually at the University of Miami, and it was working with the Miami Hall of Science and trying to figure out how to support pre-K um, kids, helping them learn about science. At the same time, that team also developed a measurement tool, right? So when you're in education, you need to be able to measure learning, right? You guys are all scientists. You know that you've got to be able to measure outcomes. And so we were able to develop not only a program that helped stimulate interest and engagement and excitement with four-year-olds, but a tool to measure outcomes in those learners that's available now for use across the nation. So if all, any of you all are interested in doing research in this space of K-12, or actually all the way up through adult education. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about funding opportunities that are available. We've got a new generative AI R&D center that we um, are hoping to announce uh, in September. We've got a program focused on improving elementary science education. There's lots of opportunities and I'm so thrilled to be able to be here and have a chance to let you all know that I'm another funding source. You don't only have to go to NSF. <laughs> and, and give us a 30 second snippet on the funding piece, on sure. what's available. Because, and part of what I want you all to do is, we're not gonna be able to answer every question. Search, search these people out after we get done with this and as we're walking down in room 304 and seeing that group, um, when we're doing the, the uh, student showcase out here, I get to announce the winners, which is gonna be really cool. That requires you to vote. Um, so you need to see the student showcase piece. So talk about maybe one funding opportunity that we might not know of. Okay, so we have our basic funding opportunities that are like R01s for those of you in the NIH world. I'm not gonna talk about those, they're kind of boring, but there is a development and innovation piece. But we have a portfolio of work, a competition announcement that's on the street right now for statistical and methodological innovation in education research. You guys do work in Bayesian, you do work that's like innovative methodologically. We have a program that's built for you so I can't remember exactly how much money it is. It's for three years, but it's out there. It's available. It's super popular. Happy to talk more with you all about that. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds great. So thank you for that piece, that funding piece. Let me ask you about partnerships now. Rebecca, you brought that up, and, and Basili, you brought that up as well, the partnership piece. So give us a little more in-depth thoughts on how to part. We, we've talked a lot over the course of today about partnerships. It's easy to throw that word out. It can be more difficult to be able to make that stuff happen. So maybe a success story in partnerships, especially maybe in a partnership that you didn't think was gonna to amount to anything and how it might work. So give us your thoughts, uh, Rebecca, we'll start with you. Um, so partnerships can be tricky to navigate, um, but I think you know one of the things about the model that we have set up uh, for the Gen AI Consortium is we were, or, fortunate enough to have uh, MITRE as a partner, um, and they facilitated uh, some of the different universities that were uh, the founders of the, the consortium, um, FIU, Marymount, uh, and Purdue, um, and UTSA. Um, and since then, we've kind of taken, UTSA has taken the lead on the consortium, and we've really tried to branch out um, to our local ecosystem, um, and we're trying to to make sure that we can provide some guided pathways from community colleges and K through 12. Um, so fortunate, I'm fortunate to be in um, University College, uh, which houses our dual credit program. Um, so that allows us to really have that touch point with K through 12. Um, but then the community colleges, uh, we 
we have some pathways um, there, but the struggle has been funding. Um, and so we're pursuing funding together, um, which also with community colleges, they may not have the infrastructure um, that some of these larger NSF grants really require. Uh, so that's been something that we've navigated. Um, and I, we, have, we, we have one under submission, um, but we haven't secured funding yet uh, with a community college, but I see it in the future of the program. Um, and it's really just going out into the community and talking about it. Um, that's, you know, that organic growth, um, and especially if it's homegrown, but then I've been to several larger conferences this year and have um, connected with Ohio State University and some of the other, um, some other universities across the, the United States um, through those avenues. And so it's really about like having that person that's gonna be out there on the ground really pushing for those, those partnerships. Yeah, and that, that really resonates with me, this idea of sort of boots on the ground and, and the community college world, some, something new to me uh, that I didn't think existed was in entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, you have those community, in Florida, it's the great 28. We've got a bunch of them floating around and then their connections to the universities are often just this amazing piece and then the K through 12 feeding into them. Um, because we know that our kids, the jobs of the future haven't been developed yet. And so not everybody needs a four year degree, believe it or not. Um, and those kinds of partnerships are really, really cool. So, uh, Vishali, t t tell me, talk to me about um, partnerships with a little more in depth with uh, USPTO. So I think I went into a little bit about some of the partnerships, but um, I think that's what really enables us. And I can go into even more that really gets into the, the K through 12. So I think about, um, you know, some of the, the work I did prior to coming to the USPTO um, was with the Girl Scouts. And um, so how do we get young girls to think about STEM and think about um, becoming innovators? And so I used to teach programs, but where did I get my information? From the USPTO website that had great curriculum on how to get people to think about, um, you know, how to um, take their idea and then maybe think about what are the patents that, are, uh, that could come out of there. Also thinking about trademark and how do you, you know, like building your whole business model. Um, and the copyrights and things like that. So we used to have great programming there. We do that with the, the Boy Scouts and um, Camp uh, Invention that is with the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Um, again, is another. I was just um, at the headquarters a couple, uh, couple weeks ago and the amount of just hands-on materials they have um, that they create to get people really enjoying this idea, young kids enjoying this concept of like innovation and how you can like make modifications, make things better. These are the things that you have to start thinking about and get people like, you know, even during the luncheon, we heard about some people didn't even hear, uh, know about a patent or the USPTO until, you know, later when they were, you know, in their jobs as professors or things like that. I didn't hear about the USPTO until they came to um, interview at the University of Virginia when I was in my fourth year of engineering there. Um, but thank God I did, because it really changed sort of the, the trajectory in my pathway of like where I went. So if we can do these for other people and at a young age, it can have such a huge impact. So uh, we rely on these partnerships to really sort of um, help the USPTO reach its mission. Yeah, and that Camp Invention, I mean, you mentioned 400,000 students, which is just, that's amazing. I know Invention Conventions, a couple hundred thousand. I mean, you're just, we're making real impacts into that into that world, which and is- And when you see the children and yeah, yeah. the spark in their yeah. eyes when they do things like that, or they come up with something, and I'm blown away with the ideas that they come up with. So there's so much that we could be doing. Yeah. Um, and to that point, and just having been at Invention Convention and hearing the problems that these kids come up with is just will blow your mind. So Emma, that takes me to you. And, and, and then for the last three minutes, we're gonna go down the line if there's anything else that you wanna say, because I, I promised Jan and back we'd be off on time. So you and I were talking a little bit about, and you mentioned sports. And, and I, it's my belief that sometimes we, 
we work STEM into the equation almost too much. We, we say STEM, 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 STEM invention, and it's like, but wait, but there are artists out there, there are philosophers out there, there are sport, kids in sports. There's a company out of Tampa that just built a new lacrosse ball, and I didn't know why, and then you find out that it has to do with the impact in the head and all this, it's just amazing. Talk us through what's actually happening down there and your thoughts on, on that for the youngsters. Absolutely. So in partnership with the USPTO and others, we recently launched a new exhibition at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Sometimes when people hear, why are you at the National Museum of American History, they scratch their head a little bit because it's not a science museum. It's a history institution. And for us, invention is an incredibly is interdisciplinary process um, that uses a lot of different skills from a lot of different um, domains. I spend a lot of time researching historical patents. There are historians um, that work in your office, I'm certain, because I've met several and many of them. Um, so there's a piece of it that has to do with that. But I think um, in terms of inspiring the next generation, one of the key pieces of the puzzle is finding an entry point that's accessible mm. and welcoming and um, sort of developmentally appropriate too. So Change Your Game is an exhibition that on the surface is about sports. It's about who invents for sports and why. But what it's really about is um, what it takes to be an inventor, who invents, um, where do they invent, what does that look like? Because it's not always a person in a lab coat in a lab. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a farmer in a gym watching a basketball hoop shatter and wondering if the spring from his tractor might solve that problem. Yeah. And so there's a piece of that at play here um, in terms of sports that it's just an incredibly compelling entry point for many, many people. But it also um, allows us to examine many different facets of the invention process. Yeah. Um, so it's the exhibit itself and then it's the public programs that go alongside it. So downstairs there are a bunch of different invention challenges. They're all themed around sports. Um, but you get to give it a shot and develop and cultivate the inventive habits of mind. Because I think the other thing I was really struck by, by your comments, Vishali, is that there's so many different places where invention happens. It's not just in the classroom with a STEM teacher. It's not just your math teacher or your biology teacher. And it's not just at home with your grown-ups. that it can happen in a lot of different places. And so um, the hope with this exhibition is that it will sort of bridge the gap between formal and informal learning. Um, and across lots of different partnerships with school children, with school teachers, with families. Yeah, and I'm struck too, we talked this morning about mentorship. It's not just for you to see them downstairs and what they're doing, it's for them to see you. Because mm -hmm. they want to look at you and say, oh, this is, this is what it means to be able to do this kind of stuff. So with 15 seconds each, uh, speed round to get done in a minute. Any last thoughts for, for this group? And Vishali, I'll talk, start with you. If you want to make an impact with the next generation of inventors out there, I ask that you come to the USPTO's website or reach out to me, Commissioner for Patents at USPTO.gov. If you have ideas, we're always willing to work with you um, to make sure that we can give you the resources you need to make the impact that you also could be making. Thanks, Priscilla. That's great. Rebecca. I, I think echoing that is that, uh, you know, we have created a, a repository of over 30 uh, modules that are geared towards getting students interested in innovation and STEM um, and they're modular to they're set up to meet students where they are at um, and they're pick and choose across a bunch of different disciplines so if you're interested in you know a partnership um, please reach out to me I'm on LinkedIn and my information is in the awesome thanks Rebecca Emma final thoughts Please come downstairs and visit us. If you go downstairs and go right and go around the corner to room 304, you can see what it looks like to inspire the next generation of inventors in real time. Kids have been doing incredible things down there all day today and will be there all day tomorrow. Um, and we'd love to have you see what that looks like um, and come chat. I won't tell you anything else until you come visit me. Awesome, thanks Emma. <laughs> Elizabeth. Yeah, we, um, there is a, we announced a competition from seedlings to scale today in the Federal Register notice. If you have the solution to make sure that every kid gets a personalized learning experience out of the box, please send us your eight-page paper. We want to hear about it, $500,000 for a year. It's a phased competition, sort of like SBIR. Happy to tell folks more about that if you're interested in learning. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you all. Please help me thank this panel, and we'll, and we'll get off the stage. Thank you very much.